I think it's about 7.05, Brett, so we can go and get started, I think. I'll keep an eye on the, the panel, the people coming in. If there's any more residents that show up, we'll, I'll pull them in. But I know that some people have got other conflicts with, uh, you know, IR call and whatnot. So we lost some people to that. But uh, it happens, you know, we're, we are a service industry and, um, you know, we got to take care of patients first. So. That's right. So um, I just want to welcome everybody. Um, if you were here for our last presentation on virtual interviewing, you know, I welcome you back. Uh, if you'd like to see that webinar, you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be posting this, uh, this to our YouTube channel as well, this webinar. Um, so Basically, as residents, we wanted to put on this lecture to basically go over our residency, why we love our residency, why we think it's a great place to train. So, all right, let's get started. All right, so when it comes to our residency, I like to think of our overall training in six parts. Um, and so I'll be breaking this up for our lecture today. So academics, clinical training, culture, finances, location, and jobs. I think all of these are important for a well-rounded residency and when it comes to overall training. So just a little bit about Temple, Texas. Uh, we do have a very long history. We began around 1880. Um, so there was a railroad that basically crossed through this area. Um, and the, this railroad purchased about 187 acres for a construction camp. Um, soon after that, they then built a hospital, which was Scott and White and that was in 1897. And then they hired the very first radiologist in 1912. So we like to say that our radiology department began at that time. And then we first started having residents in 1945. And so you'll hear Scott and White a lot. These are the two doctors that started uh, the initial hospital. And so you'll hear that reference quite a bit. All right, so just a little bit more about our history. So um, we like to talk a lot about Claudia Potter. Um, so she was hired in 1906, and she was the first female doctor hired at Scott and White. And she was also the very first female anesthesiologist in the United States. And so this just demonstrates our culture of inclusivity. And you can see that throughout our residency, um, we are very inclusive as far as um, gender, race, ethnicity, things like that. Um, so our current name is Baylor Scott and White. And so we merged with the Baylor Health System in Dallas in 2013 and as a conglomerate healthcare system, we uh, comprise of a $9 billion healthcare system. And this is the number one Texas nonprofit hospital and the number two Texas hospital overall. And they were number 10 in the United States. And so we're a very large healthcare system and this really helps for um, just um, our influence in the area and also attracting some of the um, you know some of the best residents uh, faculty and things like that and so we also have a long history in that regard too and so just to get an idea of the areas that we cover and this is something that's really important to us and really um, signifies us as a residency is our case volume. So our case volume is determined by the patient population that we serve. And although Temple, Texas is a smaller city, about 100,000 people within the general area, we serve a patient population of about 2 million people. And so you can see this area in Central Texas. Um, to the north is Dallas, which is more uh, population dense. And then uh, the blue you can see there is Central Texas. And then we have people on our healthcare plan all around that area as well. And so this allows for our residents to see a very large case volume, the size of a large city. However, we are primarily the only hospital serving this large patient population. And so Baylor Scott and White Memorial refers to the hospital here that we conduct our residency, which is in Temple, Texas. Uh, this hospital is a multi-specialty facility. We have 46 residencies and fellowship programs. And so when you have all these different uh, educational programs, 
this leads to a diverse pathology and you're rarely referring cases out. So, you know, for instance, if you have plastic surgery, if you have, uh, you know, transplant surgery, um, you'll begin to see all those cases and follow up and be getting experience with uh, those imaging studies. Um, we are a employee based setting. Uh, so this is what we call a clinic club model, which is similar to the Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, and Oshner Clinic, if you're familiar with those. Um, and then Dr. Montgomery is our department chair and he serves on the board of directors uh, for the hospital. So this is really great for having representation of radiology and our residency uh, throughout the hospital. And then when you have that represent, representation, our faculty, I like to say happy staff equals happy residents. So we're all happy here. <laughs> Um, as far as academics, uh, the resources that you'll be provided um, include paid subscriptions, which include StatDX. Um, we also have over 16,000 practice questions that are available to you um, as a resident here, and that includes Rad Primer, Board Vitals, Kevlar. Um, we also have access to Vital Source books, so the Core Review series. Um, and uh, Huda series as well, uh, which is the physics book. Um, other hard copy books are provided to you throughout your time in residency. So during your R1 or PGY2 level, you'll get core radiology, which is a great introductory book. Um, and then you'll get crack the core series, which is a very popular book for core preparation. And you'll get that in your R2 uh, PGY3 level. And then we have multiple practice tests that are written by some of the writers of the core test and your ITE. And so you get some exposure to these questions as well through this resource here. And then we have multiple additional resources on our online uh, SharePoint drive, which has multiple PDFs and other resources that are available to you. And if there's anything that you could need, which I doubt you'll really need outside of that, um, we always have availability um, to purchase books. So you can ask our uh, pro program administrator, Lisa, and she's happy to help and you can get those resources if you need it, especially with our book fund. And as far as core preparation, I, I think this is one of the most important things. I think all of those resources help with that. But I also think that a sound uh, lecture series is really important for that. So um, James Murchison, the other chief here, uh, he was very influential in reforming our lecture series. And with the help of multiple other residents um, and faculty, we've been able to make sure that we are compliant with the ABR core outline and so that all the topics uh, that could be covered for the core exam are now covered through our entire lecture series and that goes over the course of a year and then you'll get exposure to those lectures three times before you actually take the core exam and you'll be familiar with some of these rare diagnoses that you may not see um, in clinical practice despite a very high case volume. And so just some uh, examples of how we perform on our in-service training exam. So on average, um, our R2s and R3s um, have been scoring about the 75th percentile um, on our ITE exams. And this is a direct reflection of the implementation of that core outline and those specific lectures. Um, and then you can also see our core exam and certifying exam results as well over the last 10 years. Um, we also have guest lecturers, including international lecturers. So we do have a former staff, Dr. Rungi, um, who currently practices in Switzerland and is very involved in MRI research and neuroradiology. And his lectures are, um, they're very good. I mean, he's on the forefront of MRI and contrast agents. So it's really good to get his perspective. And he also serves on the editorial board um, of a major journal, uh, which is Journal of Magnetic Resonance, Resonance Imaging. Um, and then we also uh, participate in research in our program. You will be required to do one quality improvement project and one additional research project, and this is required by graduation. However, our residents um, usually do more than this. So 
Um, I know most of us have multiple QI projects uh, that we get involved in and we're also, um, we help other residents if they need uh, help on a certain research project. And then we also have multiple resources available to us. So the good thing about being in Baylor, Scott and White is that we have access to illustrators, um, people that can help with actually uh, writing a research paper. And so you have all of these different resources to help you publish. And then you can just see, see some of the examples here of the conferences that we've been accepted to over the last three years. And then you can also see uh, some of our projects that have been accepted. And these are people basically um, getting, actually going to these um, different conferences. However, um, with COVID and everything, um, we really haven't been able to travel for some of those um, research conferences. Um, other things that are good about this residency include our teaching opportunities. So we're very involved with the Texas A&M medical students and there is a mandatory two week radiology course that residents can get involved in. And this is required of all medical students. So you'll be able to give lectures, uh, participate in interactive small groups, um, and then they all also will shadow you on your different rotations. And this is a great time to demonstrate um, the importance of radiology, not only for the incoming um, people that are in, interested in radiology, but also um, other specialties and showing how we can help them as well. And so you'll be giving resident presentations. We also have tech talks, which is uh, presentations that are given to our technologists here. We have internal medicine lecture series, and then we also have tumor board that you get involved in um, as an upper level. So now to move on to our clinical training. So here we believe that you have to see it to believe it. Um, basically you need to read the study yourself to get the um, adequate experience to learn uh, radiology, um, improve some of your skills. And so radiology is unlike other specialties in that only one person can read the studies. That means dictating the report and then finalizing that report and going over it with the faculty. So this is different than say internal medicine where the resident, the medical student and the fellow can all see the patient. Radiology is very different than that. And so that's why it's important, at least in our opinion, to have a resident driven program where you have ample opportunity to read these studies, including advanced imaging studies such as MRI, CTs, um, and get this experience, which will help you in your future career and future fellowships. And so our program has two fellows, um, one IR fellow and one breast imaging fellow. However, we have six to seven radiology residents per year. So you can see the distribution there and our residents are very involved in the care of our patients. And once again, we do have a high volume program. It's not enough to overwhelm you because we always have overlap. But once you develop the speed, you're able to pick up your own speed and accuracy so that you can get a lot of exposure to these different studies. We're also known for having one of the highest OB ultrasound um, that we read, at least in our program. And then you also get heavy MRI experience during your first year. So um, in the first year, you're gonna get exposure to neuroradiology. And then as you move forward, you'll get MRI experience and other um, rotations as well. So as far as the expectations of our clinical training, on day one, you're gonna begin reading and performing procedures. So you may be doing a hip injection, shoulder injection. Uh, you may be reading a CT on day one. You may even read up to 10 CTs on the first day. It really just depends. Um, we want you to feel comfortable and we want to start good practices such as go through your search method and also get the teaching from your faculty and upper level residents as well. And all of our uh, training will be one-on-one -on -one and in person. So you'll get to check out with the faculty and almost all of our faculty are fellowship trained. So you will get access to that expertise and some great teaching. 
And then something else that we pride ourselves on is our collegial environment. So um, we pride ourselves on our department culture where you, you will feel comfortable asking questions and then also interacting with the faculty and making sure that you have a good understanding of what's going on in each imaging study. Um, and then once again, we have two fellows. And I guess the important thing to mention is that we really don't feel like our fellows are a negative impact on our study volume just because, um, for one, they're only in two different uh, rotations, so IR and breast imaging, but we have the population of, ca uh, of cases, we have multiple cases that it doesn't really compete with us as far as residents, and they more serve as teachers and actually enhance our experience as well. So um, we feel like they're very beneficial to our training. Um, and this is just some notable fellowships. Um, I'm not able to list all of them, but this is just an example of um, some of our fellowship trained faculty here. So you can see in almost every um, rotation and uh, different subspecialty, um, we have fellowship trained radiologists for each of those that are going to provide great teaching for you. And just an idea of our facility statistics. So on a yearly basis, we read over 1 million studies. Um, cardiac MRIs are typically over 200. I know I'm on CVIR right now and I typically read two or more cardiac MRIs each day. So um, that's great experience. And then OB ultrasound, as I went over, we have some of the highest volume in the nation as far as OB ultrasound. So most places, uh, the ob gyn docs will read those studies. However, in our program, we're able to get exposure to that. And those will be tested on your core exam, so it's important to get that exposure. Um, we have over 1,200 breast procedures, and we have over 12,000 IR procedures. And then um, something to mention, um, the ACGME requirements basically set some goals as far as uh, training. So certain examples, I think there's a total of nine, but these are some of the uh, more, um, more common ones, such as CT abdomen pelvis, MRI brain, MRI lower extremities. And our residents typically will read about five to 10 times the ACGME requirements. And this has a direct reflection on the kind of volume that you're getting in our program. So you're gonna get a lot of exposure to these advanced studies and procedures that it'll be really easy to get these requirements and you'll likely far exceed those. So you can see how, um, you can see the ACGME, ACGME requirements in that middle column there and then the average numbers um, of our, our graduating classes um, in that last column there. And then the average studies typically read by graduation are typically anywhere from 20,000 to 25,000. However, it really depends on the resident. I mean, some residents can get up to 30,000 studies um, over four years. And so this is an example of some of the rotations that you'll be on. So we typically in the first year, uh, those residents will get four week blocks. So you'll have time to get exposure to that subspecialty and that rotation. Um, and then you'll have time to read, ask questions and really get a solid footing um, in that rotation. And then as you gain more experience in your PGY three year, uh, you'll move to two week blocks that will be the uh, same as core rotations, but the what will happen is you'll add CV, which is cardiovascular imaging, such as CTAs, um, MRI cardiacs, um, IR, and um, other advanced studies like that. We'll add a night float, which is typically three to four weeks over the course of that year. Um, you'll have breast imaging, which is eight weeks, and IR, which is eight weeks as well. Um, and then once you get to PGY four and five year, you'll also continue these two week blocks. You'll have a little bit less of night float and IR. Um, and then in your R3 year, you'll have four weeks of breast imaging. And then R4, you'll have some screening and then uh, potentially some elective time. Um, and then as far as weekend coverage, um, so in your R2 year, um, we have our Saturday and Sunday shifts, which are 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. This will be, um, so our, our PGY3s or R2s will be covering this. And then also a Saturday, 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. So it'll be an overnight. And it's typically about 15 weekends um, over the year of that R2 year. 
and the class is able to schedule that. If they need to switch, they can work with each other and be able to switch that. And you do get call money for taking any of these weekend coverages or call. So in your R3 and R4 year, you'll begin backup call, which is interventional radiology. And that can be Monday through Thursday after hours or Friday through Monday, which will be coverage of the weekend. Um, and these are typically IR, emergent procedures, and pediatric upper GI or intussusception reduction. Um, it's typically about seven to nine weekends um, over the course of those years, um, each year. And then vacation, uh, you get 15 days of vacation and 13 sick, sick days each year. Um, as far as holiday coverage, so the R1s and R4s will have all holidays off. Uh, R2, you'll have uh, two major holidays and one minor, or one major and two minors. Um, the biggest thing about our vacation is that you get a guaranteed whole week off. Uh, so you'll only have to give two vacation days, and then you'll get the entire week off. And this can be during Christmas time, or this can be the week after. It's really your choice, and that'll be seniority based. We also have ESAR, which is early specialization in interventional radiology. So if you're interested in interventional radiology, um, we have two spots for that um, each year. And so you'll apply in your R2 years or your second year of radiology. Um, and it really just depends on how many people in your class are interested. But the really good thing about um, this program is that you can, if you're not sure you wanna do interventional radiology, you're not sure if you wanna do diagnostic imaging or interventional radiology, you can get exposure to interventional radiology and then um, decide if you wanna apply for this early specialization. And then you'll complete one year of fellowship after that. And we do have um, a position in interventional radiology as a fellowship here. All right, and so so one of the biggest things uh, for our program, um, as, aside from our academic and clinical training, is our culture. So we are very involved um, with residents and faculty and making sure that we are very involved in um, events and uh, different social events. However, it has been difficult with COVID um, basically getting all these uh, social events together. Uh, we do attempt to do some wellness um, days um, where we may not have a lecture that day and we may have a Taco Tuesday or cupcakes or uh, team togetherness where we can um, basically promote um, uh, resident and physician wellness. And so, the, so on a normal year, we typically have multiple events. We have monthly resident happy hours. We have journal clubs. Uh, we have semi-annual golf tournament, uh, monthly IR poker night. And so this may not even apply to you um, when you actually apply and um, actually begin residency here. So this is something that you can expect. And these are just some more pictures of us getting together. Um, we had a Thanksgiving potluck that's in the top left. Uh, we have our wonderful program director, Dr. Schnitker, up in the right in our semi-annual golf tournament. We have our Oktoberfest. One of our faculty um, actually plays the accordion and um, is actually very good um, at German style music. And so we'll have his music playing and um, it's just a really good time. We also have our crawfish broil um, and then other events at our department chair, Dr. Montgomery's house. And so that's always really good to get everyone together. Um, and just another thing on culture, um, when, we, when we say it's like a family, we're not kidding. Uh, we've had multiple family members uh, in our department. So our current department chair is Dr. Montgomery, but his father before him was also a chairman um, at an earlier time. Um, and here's some other examples. So we have our program director here, Dr. Schnicker. Uh, his brother is also an alumni of our program. And then we have uh, our current neuroradio neuroradiology staff, Dr. Sonier, and then Brandon Sonier, who's our current resident. So, um, so it just shows you, you know, we are a family here, and we're, and we mean actual real families. <laughs> um, 
as far as the intern year, um, I just wanted to go over that in some more detail. So when you apply to our program, you will get automatic acceptance to the intern year. It will be a separate application, but if you match to our program, you will get that automatic acceptance. And I really like this because you get to spend all five years in this program. You get familiar with our hospital, with other residents and faculty in the system. And I feel like this can be really helpful helpful once you start radiology. And then you also get early bonding with your co-residents in radiology, which I feel is uh, very important. And then we have Lisa, who's a huge part of our culture and our department, and she is one of the best program coordinators um, slash administrators. And she basically gets everything done for our program. Um, she's very on top of paperwork, anything you need. I mean, she's already thinking about how she can help you. Um, I know that she was very helpful when I was applying to fellowship. Uh, she offered to send all of my documents um, to all the different programs. And that's just great having someone that's so proactive, um, that is really in your corner, that will do everything she can to help us su succeed, whether that's through resources um, or just preparing for, you know, training or, you know, different reminders, things like that. Um, and so just to get a little bit into finances, uh, we do have competitive pay here. Uh, we have a 403B uh, retirement plan, which is a is kind of colloquially called a Roth 401k. Um, we get a 5% employee match, um, and you also can be considered for a public service loan forgiveness, so five to 10 years since we are a nonprofit organization. We have affordable health insurance, uh, which is typically $30 per pay period. We have some of the best cost of living, um, some of the cheapest cost of living in the nation. So it's really easy for our residents to buy houses and most, most do. Um, and there's also very good real estate here. So you'll get a lot of value from your mortgage. Um, we get $500 for our education education spending fund. And I talked earlier about how you'll get hard copy books and that does not factor into this. I haven't even used my $500 yet because we have so many resources and so many different question banks that I haven't need, needed to use it. But if, if there's something you really want, we have availability for that. And then when it comes to AIRP, um, which is uh, the rad path correlation that's usually in DC, um, Maryland, we have some of the highest pay for that. I know some places, um, they may not give you any money for that, but we are very supportive in our residency and make sure that you have enough money to pay for um, all the housing and things like that. Um, additionally, you won't have to take vacation days. Uh, you'll get those four weeks and it'll be built into your schedule. So that's really convenient. We also have multiple scholarships um, for any types of research conferences. Um, obviously we can't do those necessarily this year because of COVID, but in years past and in the future, um, you will have opportunities to have your uh, transportation, your hotels paid for if you get accepted um, to any one of these large conferences. And then you get free parking here, so that's great too. Um, and this is just an example. Um, so these are the official uh, salary that you will get based on your PGY level. Um, and this is for 2020 to 2021. So you get an idea of kind of what our compensation is like. Um, another big thing as far as um, your salary and supplementing your salary is moonlighting. And so we have many opportunities uh, with internal or in-house moonlighting. Those are basically synonymous terms. Uh, you won't need a medical license. You won't need insurance. This will be with your faculty that you work with on a daily basis. And you'll get this availability in your very first year of radiology. Uh, so we have Mersing, which you get to basically serve as an IR nurse after hours. This is $90 per hour if you come in. Um, so you'll have a pager and they'll give you a call if there's a case. So for instance, that's, um, so um, Rudkins, who's one of our R1s, he got called in. Um, and so that's why he couldn't be, be here tonight, but um, he'll be getting that $90 per hour. Um, but if you don't get called, um, you still get $100 for holding that pager. Um, we also have after hours readers, so um, any CT chest, any CT body studies, 
um, that are left over from the end of the day. Uh, you'll get to read those from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then you'll also uh, get access to the emergency department as well, where you'll read CTs. And that's usually about, you know, 30 to 30 or more studies. It really just depends on the night. Um, we also have weekend neuro shift, which is typically 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and that'll be $90 per hour, and you'll be reading all neuro MRI and CT studies, and this is mainly for upper level residents, uh, but you really get such a high exposure to these neuro studies. I mean, it can be anywhere from 50, 60, even, even higher than that um, as far as total studies in one day, and so that's that really supplements your education, uh, getting all of these opportunities. And, but if you wanna do any type of outside moonlighting, say you find a good opportunity, um, you're definitely allowed to do that. Just keep in mind, you'll need a Texas license and malpractice insurance. And then as far as just seeing where our salary goes, uh, it seems like a lot of residents really enjoy traveling. Um, so we've had residents go pretty much everywhere around the world. Um, so you'll definitely have those opportunities uh, with our uh, competitive salary and moonlighting. Um, so this is just some examples. I mean, you can see some of our residents have gone to Asia, to Europe, uh, Mexico, Central America. Um, so all those opportunities are available to you um, if you'd like to do that. Um, as far as the location here in Temple, we're just north of Austin. Um, it's about 45 minutes north of Austin. Um, it's a rapidly growing area, um, if you're not uh, familiar with the area. And this leads to a great real estate value, which I talked to before. Um, what I really like about Temple is that there's minimal traffic. You live very close to the hospital. I like that I can get back to my house in about 15 minutes. Some people live even closer, maybe five to 10 minutes. Um, so you're not sitting in traffic after a long day or say you've been working overnight, you can get home. But if you want to get all the amenities of a city, you can have that. So um, we live we live very close to Dallas, Fort Worth, which is two hours away. Houston is about two and a half. Austin, like I said, is about 45 minutes. Waco is about 30 to 45 minutes north of us. So you have plenty of opportunities um, if there's something you wanna see. I mean, Temple is great in its own regard, um, but if there's something in these other cities that you wanna attend, whether that's concerts, sporting events, you name it, um, you'll have that opportunity. And if you want to go anywhere else in the nation, it's great being near these airports and cities. Um, so if you want to go on an international trip or just anywhere else, um, you can basically compare the prices um, from any of these airports. Um, so just some general things in the area. Um, so we have multiple breweries, not only in Temple, but also in Salado, which is about 20 minutes south of here. Um, they also have wineries, things like that. Um, we also have, um, you know, the, the Magnolia Market, uh, which is a great restaurant um, in the silos, which is um, in Waco, about 30 to 45 minutes north of here. Um, in Austin, there's multiple restaurants, uh, multiple concerts and music festivals. I know some of our residents like to go to some of these music festivals. And so there's always something to do um, if you're interested in it. Um, and these are just some other examples in the Austin area. So the Domain is a very popular place to go with uh, multiple shopping opportunities, uh, restaurants, uh, things like that. Um, and then as far as job opportunities in this residency, um, it really just depends. Um, we have residents that graduate here and they may work anywhere across the nation. Um, I would say probably around a third to a half choose to go um, outside of the general area. Um, the rest of them choose to work in the Texas area and almost every major private practice and uh, some of the academic institutions as well uh, has some of our past residents. And so um, they're very successful in their practice. Some are actually um, leading those practices. And so that's really good for future job opportunities. And another thing that's important when it comes to job opportunities and name recognition is having national representation. So uh, Dr. Montgomery, our department chair, he is the past uh, Texas Radiological Society president um, and Dr. Monticello, who was the immediate past um, 
um, ACR president. Uh, she has also been the SBI president as well. She's very influential in this residency and um, has very high regard in the national community. Um, we also have our nuclear medicine staff, Dr. Middleton, who was the president of the Society of Nuclear Medicine as well. Um, and so this is just an example of some of the fellowships uh, that our residents um, have been accepted to in the past. Um, our immediate, um, so the, our current seniors, these are where we matched last year. Um, we're very happy with where we were placed and we feel like we've been well prepared and are happy to uh, start that next path. And then you can follow us on social media. So we do like to be very involved in social media so that we're very transparent with you um, and you can see uh, what we enjoy to do. Um, you can look at some of the social events we've had in the past um, and then just any general information about our residency, um, including a lot of the information that I've went over today. All right, so we'll get into some discussion now. I think uh, I can start off right here. Um, my name is Rob Leonard. I'm one of the interns uh, doing medicine right now, but uh, looking forward to starting radiology soon. Um, so with the why I chose Temple, um, so I went to school at Texas A&M, so I was familiar with uh, Baylor Scott and White. And um, throughout the whole interview process, um, looking at several programs, um, it was really the resident-run hospital that got me um, that let me choose Baylor Scott and White. It was, um, you know, having not having a ton of fellows makes it easy for you to get kind of the exposure as a resident um, and all the application, all the uh, like procedure volume, imaging volume. I feel like I learned best with uh, actually like seeing and doing. Um, so that's how I ranked uh, Baylor Scott and White up top. Um, so far, medicine's been pretty uh, pretty chill. So um, I was home by five o'clock, so that's been good. Um, I was uh, so I couples matched, and uh, my girlfriend's getting home quite late, seven forty-two right now, and uh, so she's still hard at work delivering quality healthcare. Um, but it's been really nice, um, especially being able to meet a bunch of my classmates as well, um, all in the same program. Hey, uh, I'm Sean. I'm one of the other interns. I actually was uh, I went to med school with Rob, so. Um, you know, getting to continue on that legacy, I guess. Uh, he kind of touched on the, the intern year already, so I'll, I'll uh, stay away from that. But just my own experience with uh, the application process. Um, I, too, couples matched. Um, so, you know, I had to share that experience here. But um, one of the things that I really liked uh, about this program specifically, on top of everything that's been touched on before, was, uh, again, really the, the, the feel of the program and really the, the vibe I got from a lot of the residents. I know that's something that you guys will really hear a lot through this, uh, through the application cycle of like, oh, I really like the feel here. So that it can sound like kind of a cliche, but really something that really stuck with me here was a lot of the residents here uh, in the radiology department really genuinely wanted to be here specifically. That, you know, you don't hear a lot of them like, oh man, well, I ranked this number 100 and I kind of just fell here and like, well, I guess uh, this is where I'm doing my residency. You know, a lot of them are like, you know, I, I wanted to be here, so I ranked it highly, and now I'm here, and I'm loving it. And, I, you know, when so many people around you are saying that, I think that really speaks volumes about the program. Um, so that was something that really resonated with me. And now that I'm here, even as just an intern, um, you know, I can tell that that really was true. Uh, you know, that was really a true sentiment. Um, another thing that really stuck out with me uh, was the, you know, not just the residents, but, you know, the faculty really care about you, um, even as just an applicant. Um, so, you know, my little story with that was on match day, um, I got a call from uh, the PD, Dr. Schnitger. Um, and again, I, I couples match, my fiance is in a different department in anesthesia. And um, Dr. Schnitger's first question to me after the like, congratulations, you matched here, we we're so excited was, you know, I don't, we don't get the results from the other departments, where did Bailey match? And, you know, that just kind of stuck with me again, that this wasn't just a like, mid-interview season like trying to you know throw some some fluff of oh I know your couple's matching like he actually like not only cared but he actually remembered her name from months ago um and that just that really stuck with me so that's what I love about this program 
Uh, just one more thing with the intern year, though. Um, just maybe something different. It's uh, if you with all these interviews for intern years, a lot of them don't let you take like a radiology elective. And this is actually the only one that allowed you to. So all the other intern years were like, OK, well, for your prelim, how about for your elective time, you do like nephro consults or something. And um, this one you could actually do like spend time with the radiology department, um, which is really nice. Also, one more thing on the uh, the intern year this is particularly pertinent for uh, couples matchers, but really anybody that's interested in doing their intern year in the same location as their um, you know their, their radiology residency, save themselves a move. Um, so, essentially, the way it works is if you it is a separate separate application, um, but if you want the spot in internal medicine and you do match here for radiology, you effectively will get that spot in the intern year. So it's not technically a categorical program, but it, 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 it effectively can be if you want it to. Um, but that said, you don't have to do your intern year here uh, if you choose not to. So I think our, out of our intern class, uh, with me and Rob, most of us are doing our intern year here, but two aren't um, just by their own choice. So it's, it's nice that you have that flexibility if you want it. All right, hello everybody. My name is uh, Dylan Denault. I'm one of the PGY2s here, uh, representing for our class. And let's see what we want to talk about. Um, so I actually ended up doing my internship um, in Florida, um, not because I didn't want to do my internship in Texas in a uh, Temple, but I wanted to burn that year, you know, going somewhere I would never be, or I, I might not, I might never live again. So um, I kind of did that as that, and. Um, the transition coming to Temple is basically, you know, I'm coming in brand new, so might have some similarities to our PGY ones, but um, I really ended up seeing a lot of what it was that I was looking for in my radiology program. Um, you know, when you try and match, you don't really know, you hope that you know where you're going and, you know, what that, that program encompasses, but that's really hard to gauge in, um, you know, a short interview season or what you can find on the web or you know, a one day interview, especially for you guys, since you're gonna have to be doing it, you know, you're not actually gonna come to the facilities. So um, I was really pleasantly surprised that I, that Baylor was what I thought it was. Um, and so I guess to talk about my transition, it's probably um, talking about what I expected of Baylor. Um, so when, when I tried to find the residency program that wasn't right for me, I really got overwhelmed at first because there's what 150 odd programs. You basically don't know anything about any of them except for maybe some that are close by. Other than that, it's like, where do I even start? Um, so I started broad. Actually, I'm from California, um, but I ended up in Temple just because of kind of how I filtered through all these things. I knew I wanted to be in a warm climate, so I just that knocked off, you know, like a substantial number of programs for me. So that was good. Um, Another thing I knew I wanted, you know, I wanted a decent sized city. I didn't want to deal with the traffic, um, but I wanted access to amenities. Um, you know, I wanted access to outdoors and things like that, that I can do on my free time. Um, I think Temple had all that for me. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of fun stuff I'm looking forward to doing in Austin once, you know, COVID opens things up. And then, you know, I was really trying to figure out how to determine what residency program was going to give me that um, that education that I wanted, because I think that was kind of my driving factor in selecting my programs. And, um, you know, initially I was like, oh, okay, I just got to pick the program that's known the best. You know, I was like, that's going to give me everything I need. Um, but I think as I, you know, went on more auditions and I talked to more residents, and I talked to more fellows, it was, um, it came down a lot to, you know, what you wanted to do once you got out of residency. And I knew for me that was going to be going into private practice. Um, and I wanted to be, you know, an asset to my, my group when I go out of residency. And um, I think in order to do that, you have to have a lot of hands-on practice. You know, you have to be versatile. And I think a program that is resident run really does that for you. Um, so that's, you know, one of the reasons kind of like Sean and Rob mentioned that I wanted to come to Baylor because I think they are really resident run and you do, I do want that hands-on exposure. You know, I want to see that, that patient rather than looking over the fellow's shoulder and, you know, getting it, getting that experience that way. Um, 
and a lot of programs that did have the same diversity of pathology had significantly more fellows. So this, to me, was like that sweet spot that I wanted, um, that I figured out that I wanted over time, you know, doing all these auditions and things like that. Um, and so far, you know, I haven't been here very long, but um, I'm, I'm seeing that everything there, I'm getting what I wanted. Um, some other things I picked up on interview day is that the culture out here is different. You know, I was coming from California. Um, I did all my rotations out there in the hospital. Interactions between, you know, staff and residents wasn't always as collegial as it, as it is here. Like it's actually noticeable. Um, and I really wasn't expecting that because, you know, I got the same lecture that, ever, that everyone's telling you now. They're like, oh yeah, it's a great culture, but it's like, oh, is it, are they just saying that? But no, it's like, it's palpable. It's kind of weird. Um, and it's, it's present like from all the attendings I've met to and the residents and things like that. So um, I was really pleasantly surprised with, you know, that I, that I got what I was looking for there. And that comes across with uh, Lisa too, our coordinator too. And um, I don't know, there's a, there's a lot I can say, but uh, see if I touch on everything. Yeah, so, so far I've probably worked with, um, I don't know, four or so upper levels. All of them have been great, um, except Ryan, he's, he's all right. <laughs> no, <clears throat> I really like all my upper levels. They've all been super helpful. I couldn't ask for more. I always feel comfortable asking whatever questions I need. Um, and the same is true for all the attendings too, um, which I think could be a big hurdle because um, you know, if you're not going to ask that question, then you're going to miss a learning opportunity. I know that's really true for me. Um, so that's something I really particularly appreciate. And uh, yeah, we'll move on. Uh, hey guys, my name is Corey. I'm one of the R2s or PGY3s. It feels, it feels a little weird to say. Uh, to describe my experience in the ED and night float, um, to, you know, to tell you that story, I can tell you the PGY2 story of uh, being, you know, July 1st and I'm on MSK and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so slow. I'm just trying to figure out where the ulna is and, and slowly, and, you know, slowly staff and, and your little residents kind of build you up along the way. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're covering weekends, you're covering nights. And, that, and that's been wonderful. Uh, so the graduated responsibility is is pretty um, it's pretty stepwise throughout the program. Uh, we start at, as a PGY three or as an R two. We take weekend calls. We're taking weekend day calls at that time. So I know you guys saw that we had that uh, the super great moonlighting opportunity for neuro. So they'll actually you know cover the ED neuro from eight to six. And so when you're taking that kind of initial steps into into covering the weekend call. Uh, you're pretty much just covering the emergency department as a whole and the moonlighter is covering neuro up until 6 p.m. And you do that for, for a shift or two, then all of a sudden, then you're taking the night call as well, which will, you, you will read pretty much all the studies that come through, including neuro um, all night. And, that, and that's just been great. I could definitely see myself kind of growing as a, as a PGY3 R2 along the way. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm faster, I'm, I'm better, more accurate. I'm able to answer clinicians' phones without, you know, without bugging staff or bugging the upper level, or that sort of thing. Um, and th so it's been, it's been wonderful. I, I, you know, I couldn't have asked for more. So I guess I can go next. Uh, <laughs> I'm Ashley. I'm one of the uh, PGY3s, but second year radiology residents too. And so the big change for me this year was also starting to do um, ED shifts and starting to do night float and that transition there. And I would say, I think our program does a pretty good job transitioning us in. It's intimidating at first because you go from, you know, reading and then checking out with your staff and then sending them your report to reading the study and just sending it straight to them. So you don't get a chance to review it with them first, with your staff first. And so you're like, well, if I get it wrong, I'm just gonna get it wrong and they're gonna see it. <laughs> and that's a little scary. Um, but with all your experience that you've had through your first year, you'll find you actually start adapting really quick. Um, and I think it works you in well and just starting to become you know, more of your own radiologist like we're all trying to do. Um, and so it's fun at the same time as it's a little scary to start out with and I'm already a lot more comfortable than I was just 
you know, not even halfway into my uh, second radiology year. And so far as the night float goes, I mean, Corey kind of talked about all the hours and things like that, so I'm not going to touch so much on the hours. Um, but the night float, you know, your first shift, you're like <laughs> trying to stay awake. But you, you've been through it on intern year because pretty much every intern year, I think, has a night float. And it's a lot different because, you know, you're doing radiology, so you're doing something you really like and you really love to do. And again, it's it's fun. It's hard to stay awake at first <laughs> until you get adjusted. Um, but it's really enjoyable and I think the transition itself at our program is a good tr way to transition. You know, it's not like you're being thrown in your first two weeks. Like I've had some time to learn radiology to really be able to get the most out of the rotation. Um, and so I still like it. And it's not, again, it's not like, like our year. Um, so the weekends that you have to work since your second year is your heaviest call year, it still only ends up being like, um, like one to two, maybe three weekends a month at most, um, because you're splitting it through between your whole class, which is nice because, you know, my intern year I was working almost every weekend, you know, it may not be two days the whole weekend, but still having weekends off in between is very, very, very nice. I don't know. Is there anything else, Brett, you wanted us to comment on about the uh, weekends or the nights? No, not really. <laughs> All right. Sorry, it's, well, it's hard. Fine. It's hard to uh, touch the screen at the top when I'm in presenter <laughs> mode. But no, that was great. I'll go on to the next one. Yeah. All right, guys. Hey, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the uh, PGY fours. Uh, let's see. Describe your experience starting back call and IR. So um, I'll say one of the good things about moonlighting. So uh, Brett mentioned mersing. Uh, you know, it really gave me a great backup in IR in terms of uh, getting to know the staff, getting to know all the techs. Um, so I uh, certainly feel like the transition for me personally, a backup call was really um, seamless. Um, you, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, documents um, in that, that prior uh, residents have made in terms of uh, kind of what to do and, and, uh, and um, kind of um, who to call and what, what the next step is. So um, certainly even if you don't moonlight, um, I think that that, tra that um, tra transition to backup call would, would be pretty uh, easy. Um, you know, in terms of core prep, um, I th think our lecture series, uh, mainly through all James's work, um, has been awesome. Uh, we, we now have a um, dedicated core lecture series, which really kind of dives in deep on um, all, all the topics. I know Brett touched on that earlier, but, but I feel like uh, um, it's hard to learn, learn what you need to know for core from uh, doing a um, 30,000 foot view on each uh, topic. If you just have one lecture series for peds or one for, for neuro, it's just, you know, it's kind of hard, hard to get into the nitty gritty of what you need to know for core. So, so I feel like what James has done, I'm um, in terms of, um, you know, ha having, I mean, what we're, do we're doing GI right now. And I think James has been lecturing on GI for like two or three weeks now. Um, so, so just having very detailed lectures, I, I think has been awesome. Um, and then, uh, you know, as far as the, the last question, describe the newly established lower leverage chief role. So um, I, for, 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 forgot to uh, mention so i'm going to be a chief next year i'm a chief this year so i'm the junior um, scheduling chief and then we also have a junior recruiting chief um so you know in terms of um kind of smoothing the the um transition from from not be being a chief to be being a chief i think, think that has certainly helped um James is uh, kind of stepping me through scheduling and all that. Um, so I think that that's going to be a good change as well. Um, you know, I'm kind of, um, that's about all, all, all I have to say on that. Okay. Yeah, another thing I'll say is um, what's great about having the lower level uh, chief roles, uh, it was something we newly implemented. And this was really good to get an idea of, kind of some of the, not necessarily concerns, but uh, just that you're better representing a larger portion of the residency. And that's really important to us um, to make sure that everyone feels represented and that we can best serve your education and things like that. So that has also been, um, I feel really good of implementing those new lower level chiefs. 
All right, so I'll, I'll let James take this. Um, so describe a fellowship interviewing and how does this residency prepare you for fellowship? Yeah, so um, I'm James, um, I'm scheduling chief this year um, and I was uh, one of the, I guess, junior chiefs last year. I'm uh, obviously kind of involved in updating a lot of things uh, regarding you know lectures and uh, schedules and whatnot. But as far as fellowship interviewing, um, you know, we have had a, a lot of residents go wherever they want to go for residency. I mean, I got my top choice. Um, you know, I have, you know, two or three other, you know, staff that have gone to the same program. So I'm going to Barrow um, next year for neuroradiology. I'm super excited about that. Um, one of my fellow co-residents is also coming with me. Um, and so, you know, I couldn't be happier about going out to Phoenix uh, to get training in an awesome program. But literally, I mean, everyone, I, all the prior residents, whenever I came here, when I talked to them, they all ended up at their top places. Um, you know, fellowship's a lot different than uh, radiology, you know, residency interviews. You know, it's, it, the competitiveness changes quite a bit, um, mainly because of the fact that there's still a lot of fellowship spots available out there. Um, you know, where I'm going for Barrow, do they take seven neuro spots? I mean, that's, you know, and now I think they're moving up to eight potentially. You know, here we only take, we take six and seven, you know, radiology residency spots. So there's, there's a lot of fellowship spots out there that don't go field every year necessarily. Um, the top program is obviously filled typically, but, um, you know, it, it, the numbers change, you know, and you become, uh, you're in a much more advantageous part. So, you know, like I only interviewed at, you know, four or five places. Um, and I felt really comfortable that I had an op opportunity to go to any one of those places. Um, just because of the fact that, uh, I felt like they really wanted me. And I don't think that, I think that that's just how it is for fellowship. I think that, uh, you know, you can talk to any of my fellow classmates about that too. And they all ended up at essentially their top programs. Um, they're all going to great places. Um, and so, you know, as far as preparing us for fellowship, you know, one of the things that you need in order to be, you know, ready for fellowship is you just need to be sitting there reading studies. And I personally, you know, you know, we read over 20,000 studies, 20, 25,000 studies, you know, and, you know, we're in moonlight neuro shift, you're sitting there reading MRs, you know, advanced neuro MR, you know, advanced CTs, uh, you know, temporal bone CTs, you know, you're just reading it and you're then signing off on it, sending it to staff on your weekend shift. So, I mean, you're essentially reading all these advanced neuro studies that, you know, you might not read until you're in fellowship, but, you know, I'm not checking that with the staff. You know, I have to know what I'm going to say and, and figure that out and you make those calls. Um, and it's kind of a gradual transition process. You know, I mean, I'm a PGY5 now as a, you know, as a R2 or a PGY3, that would have been a little bit daunting. I don't think I would have been quite ready to do it. But, uh, you know, now I've, I've had some more experience um, and it's been it's been great. You know, it really helps you to kind of understand where you're going to be at. Because when you get to fellowship, you, you know, you want to kind of hit the ground running. And I think that that's been true, you know, with our past, you know, residents, when you talk to them, you know, they kind of end up in leadership roles in their fellowship just because of the fact that they're already kind of working at a fellowship level. They're, they're reading studies, you know, effectively, efficiently, accurately. Um, and, they, you know, they keep their, you know, they keep their words short. They're not necessarily sitting there having to uh, work through and try to figure everything out, you know, in fellowship when they didn't get a chance to read it during um uh, during residency. And that's true, you know, not just for neuro, you know, our MSK, you know, I just got off MSK MR and like I read, you know, 15 MRs each day, 15, 20 MRs each day by myself, you know, and I was, you know, reading them out, you know, half the time I'd just send some of the easy ones to staff and the hard ones I'd give them, I talk, I'd check them out with them. It's just one of those things where, you know, I'm, you know, able to read out, you know, ankles and knees and shoulders and arthrograms and things like that. And you just get really comfortable because you're doing so many of them. Um, I think that that volume is really the key. Um, and so getting the opportunities, whether it's, you know, whatever field you want to go into, uh, for subspecialties and that is, is important. And that's why I think that's why finding a place that doesn't have too many fellows is, is key for residency, at least, um, you know, that changes a little bit with fellowship. Um, and then being an upper level chief role, you know, the upper level chief roles, you know, you know, me and Brett are both chiefs this year. Um, we both kind of take different roles. I, you know, chief, Brett's got uh, recruiting on his mind and I've got kind of scheduling. Um, but that being said, I, I feel like one of the things that I really wanted us to work on this year, especially with having, you know, two upper level chiefs and two lower level chiefs, is making sure that we all are cohesive and we work together. And so that's been one of the things we, you know, we meet regularly, you know, we, we talk a lot, you know, we bounce ideas off each other because, you know, I know I don't have all the answers. I don't think, you know, anybody else will tell you that if they have all the answers, they're, they're probably wrong. So, you know, you know, listening to other people, trying to find out what the best solution is because um, I mean, that's how you get the best out of a program. That's how you get the best out of a residency and, you know, trying to make it better for everybody is, is, is you know, the name of the game as far as being a chief.
Yeah, so um, so I think that was really great um, as far as what James said. Um, I won't reiterate some of those things, but um, one thing I would add is that um, something that's really good about this program, not only reading the advanced MRIs and CTs and getting some of the high volume with those studies that will help you for fellowship, um, also the procedures as well. Those are some of the um, things that you may potentially compete with fellows the most. And so if you're getting exposure to all these procedures, um, I know that uh, you can get over 500, even close to 1,000 procedures uh, by the time you're done with residency here. And so um, no matter what fellowship you're going into, you're going to have heavy exposure to those procedures. Um, so you'll feel well prepared for that. But the other thing is um, a lot of private practices will require you to do some basic procedures that may not be in the fellowship uh, that you um, actually uh, completed. And so for instance, you know, if you have to do a paracentesis, um, you have to do a lumbar puncture, you know, a thoracentesis, and say you're a breast imager and you didn't get exposure to that during residency, well, then you're not going to know how to do that procedure, but that's one of the things that's required of you um, as far as just basic uh, procedure competency. And so I, I really feel like our program uh, sets us up for that, that we these procedures are almost muscle memory, second nature for us. And so um, I think that'll be something that'll not only um, help us, you know, start in fellowship and, uh, you know, start getting started early and feel really comfortable, but also during the uh, jobs as well. So, yeah. And then as far as upper, upper level chief roles, I mean, you know, I'm very honored to be one of the chiefs this year. And I think, one of the best things about it is just representing uh, the other residents within the program and also making sure that there's uh, cohesiveness among the faculty and residents themselves. And I really do think that we come together, even though I may have the designated role as recruiting, uh, we all get together and, you know, maybe one of us hears a concern or something that we need to address and then we all talk about it together and we figure out how we can basically help the rest of the residency. And our faculty is very receptive to new changes. And so that includes our lecture schedule. That was something that uh, we felt uh, we needed a lecture schedule that more um, systematically went through the outlines. And so we were able to do that with ease and the faculty were very good at um, helping us with that and um, implementing those changes. So, um, so if you do have any needs as far as a resident, um, we can get that done, you know, either through the chiefs or through our faculty are very willing to help.